Patient health, BHDDH, and anchor recovery. You can do this. Hi, this is Fred. And this is Eric with Beacon Shipping Logistics. If you're a snowbird and getting ready to head south for the winter, let us take the stress out of your trip with Beacon Shipping Logistics. Spend more time with your friends and family and less time driving. Let us ship your car with no hassles. Just call us at 855-3-SHIP-IT. We can ship your car, motorcycle, truck, or RV anywhere in the world. Fully insured with great rates and door-to-door service. Thousands of dealerships all over the country trust Beacon exclusively to transport their inventory. We offer the absolute best, most reliable service in the industry with open or enclosed transport for your precious cargo. Did you see a car online in another state and just can't get it there? Whether it's in Portland, Maine, or Portland, Oregon, let us at Beacon Shipping Logistics deliver it right to your front door. That's stress-free living. Call Beacon Shipping Logistics, your one source for transporting one car or an entire fleet. It's 855-3-SHIP-IT. 855-374-4748. Or online at beaconshippinglogistics.com for service that shines. At Regan Heating and Air Conditioning, your comfort is our business. Generations of families and businesses in Rhode Island, South Shore, and Southeastern Massachusetts trust their comfort and security to a local family-owned company with decades of experience satisfying their residential and commercial customers with high-efficiency heating and air conditioning systems that can quickly pay for themselves and impeccable 24-7 service. Now save up to $2,500 on qualifying Lennox systems just as the winter's bitter cold arrives and ask about their 12-month interest-free financing. The Regan know-how and customer commitment assures your complete satisfaction and total comfort. No ducks? Regan has high-efficiency energy storage our Mitsubishi ductless units to heat or cool any area. Plus, Regan is an approved National Grid Value Plus installer that can convert your oil system to economical natural gas. Heating, cooling, and generators. Call them today and save money. 401-461-8100 or visit them online at reganhvac.com. The Chris Plant Show on AM790 Talk and Business. President Barack Obama cast law enforcement reform as a chief struggle for today's civil rights movement. You have a civil right to walk in the middle of the street. You have a civil right to reach into a police car and try to grab the cop's gun. You have a civil right to strong-arm robbery to get the makings for your spliffs. Chris Plant and his unique worldview. Weekday mornings at 10 on AM790 Talk and Business. Your home for Yankees baseball. Now, back to the Coalition on AM790 Talk and Business. Join in the conversation at 437-5000 or 888-345-0790. You are listening to the Coalition on Talk Radio, AM790 your source for news, sports, and business. Uh, joining me is, of course, my co-host, David Fisher. And joining both of us is Scott Gibbs, president of the Economic Development Foundation of Rhode Island. As always, we can be found on Facebook.com slash The Coalition Radio, our state-of-the-art blog and website, coalitionradio.us, and on the Mighty Mighty Twitter, at coalition underscore radio. Uh, Scott, welcome back to the show. I want to jump right back into the conversation we were having. You attended some local meetings last week, and you found out that we are essentially ground zero in the fullest sense in terms of urban economic development just despite all the efforts placed by the Cianci administration, which seems to, in my mind, have gone for naught in the last 12 years. Um, as a city and as a province, we no longer seem to have a real identity. We don't seem to have any sort of marketing-driven operation. to to. We seem to be resting on our laurels, I guess what I was saying. Uh, it, it's intriguing to me because, you know, the, the, if there was a genius of the Cianci administration, it was either to realize or recognize the growing trend that downtowns are no longer centers of commerce, if you will. They're centers of entertainment. And, you know, I talk about the se- secret sauce, uh, low rent, uh, artistically oriented colleges like RISD and Brown University, um, great location, near water, low rent, low rent, low rent. But, of course, that changes over time, doesn't it? It does. It changes daily. There is no static. Um, what, what's the term in marketing, Dave? You eat your young. You either innovate or someone out innovates you. Uh, we we seem to have no plan moving forward. And I'm not. I don't obsess over plans. But at the same time, we are. We seem to be rudderless, directionless. The current administration and the prior administration seems to react as opposed to as to opposed to actually come up with ideas and to move the ball forward. 
Well, I think that's absolutely true. And, uh, you know, I want to get Scott's take on some specific legislations that have, have come through this year. Uh, Joe Shikarshi's jobs bill, uh, which I read somewhere, uh, uh, 87 percent of Rhode Island businesses will not be able to take take part in this in this tax break. Um, and I think to me, and it, this is this is kind of the. Every every politician stands up and talks about small business and the lifeblood of our economy and blah blah blah, and then they create these tax breaks that really aren't designed for those small businesses. Would you would just think that's a, I, a pretty I th- fair assessment? Yeah, I think I think it's a fair assessment. I think the political nature of economic development is that everybody wants to hit a bo- hit the ball out of the park, mm-hmm. and and I think that by nature that means that it's it's very much driven by the big projects. Um, you know, and a lot of times I think that the issues of incentives are really to mask some fundamental competitive problems that you have. As opposed to solve the problems, we try to incentivize around them. So if Rhode Island's corporate tax rates are high, and we, we were the highest in New England, um, now we have the lowest top rate, um, which will quickly be matched by Massachusetts. But we really needed to figure out a way, how do we manage the corporate tax rate for everybody? Um, as opposed to creating incentives that only benefit a few companies. Now, with that being said, CBS was a big beneficiary of that, and CBS created a boatload of jobs. So they deserve that credit that well, and, put in place. And, but I, and I think that this comes down to it, too, is I think a lot of times, especially in this economic development conversation, we create these legislations that are all carrot and no stick or, or very little stick. You know, there's very little accountability as to, you know, were these jobs created? Have you held on to them for X amount of days? You know, th- there are very little parameters once you get that. Uh, nobody's gauging success, basically. Nobody really measures it. And the fact of the matter is there has been absolutely no research anywhere that's ever validated the use of incentives as a means to create sustainable economic growth. Yeah. And and who's to say a 0% tax rate is the bottom of the barrel? I mean, and mm-hmm. after that, it's, you know, giving companies money to Or who relocate. says competing on cost alone is the solution to the problem? Well, let's, let's take two real-world examples seemingly within miles of each other right here in Northern Rhode Island. And a great deal of your company's focus is on Northern Rhode Island at this point. Yeah, our yeah. real estate projects have been primarily in Northern Rhode Island. Okay. Yes. So let's take the the Lincoln 116 corridor versus, say, Woonsocket. Now, you've got a project that's been very successful right on the heart of the 116 project. It's a mm-hmm. mixed, mixed use. I would call it Class A, Grade A office yep. office space. Um, and then you've got the very successful Highland Park. Now, what's intriguing to me is that if you were to drive the r- length of Route 116 down to the Smithfield border, you would see burgeoning growth and development that's almost spectacular when compared to the rest of Rhode Island. You've got, you've got companies like Jijana Corporation, which um, you know I'm familiar with, which uh, created a, a state-of-the-art truck manufacturing facility right in the heart of Smithfield uh, in, in a growing industrial complex. Uh, you've got uh, retail. You've got now some residential popping up. You've got hotel. And as you go more towards the Cumberland border, you've got Class A office space popping up all over the place, inhabited by the likes of everyone, I think, from state-of-the-art dental practices to Fleet Bank. But you, you've also got a pretty significant entertainment value on that road. I mean, one of the best new restaurants in the state, I think, Blackie's Pub, is over there on 116. It's a great kind of nouveau pub. Right. So you, you've got that happening. So you've got a, what I'll call the halo effect emerging from that growth, and you guys have participated in that. Now, let's let's then take, you know, as we affectionately refer to here, it as Wooney. Um, Woonsocket is, you know, let me compare that to Bentonville, Arkansas. Bentonville, Arkansas is the home, of course, of the Walmart Corporation. If you've ever been down there, uh, if you've ever worked for a consumer products organization, at one point or another, you've made the pilgrimage to Mecca, if you will, and you've got burgeoning growth, a, an, an entire, as you called it, an ecosphere that surrounds Bentonville. Why hasn't that happened in downtown Woonsocket? What advice would you give to the current administration? That's a really good question. Um, what, what you see when you drive up into the park and you come up 99 and you wait in traffic to get into the park, I would say that 50% of the license plates that you see going into the park are Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Woonsocket's challenge and the challenge of a lot of our urban communities is one of human resources. I think you have a, a a workforce that really lacks the human, the the, the 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 capacity to be effective participants in the workforce that's generated in Highland. You've got you've got biotechnology companies, pharmaceuticals, you've got CVS, you've got Tiffany's, you've got all these companies, 
and you and you have a workforce that's just not connected well with with that demand. Uh, you know, I I I know a few people who work up at CVS and uh, from from and this is secondhand, obviously, but uh, they told me that most of the Woonsocket residents that they employ are employed in their warehouses. That's correct. In the Mark Stevens facility. Yeah. 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 The I mean, so how? And this gets back to the core argument today, the core discussion today, government's proper role. Yep. So government, in a sense, then should be focusing on improving the quality of the educational system so that the jobs that the facilities your company creates attract are actually then tenanted by, if you will, by Rhode Islanders, opposed to grabbing people from out of state who live conveniently 10 miles, 20 miles away, with better school systems, lower taxes, and a, and a, and a cleaner, cleaner form of government. I, I, I absolutely agree. I think that, that government's role is to, be, to invest in infrastructure, which includes human resources. It means to transform their institutions so that they're more responsive and more effective and, and leave the marketplace alone because the marketplace is too volatile. You can't play the game. But the more we try to trick the system... The more we try to really game it, the more we fall on our face, and I think that's I think that's the challenge because politically, to, to to focus on those kinds of ingredients are long-term plays. They're not short-term plays, and political systems are driven by short-term play. They want effect. They want results so they can take credit for it, and that's not to be that's not meant to be a criticism. It's the nature of the business. Um, well, when you have to run every two years yeah. for your seat, that becomes the reality. Or if the governor, you're running every four. I mean, it's heavy lifting that you got to do right now, and that heavy lifting is is really a workforce infrastructure strategy, as far as I'm concerned. Have you ever found any with your projects any trouble attracting private financing for financially viable projects? Um, no. So even even at some of the height in one of the most difficult markets in America, even at the height of really one of the worst recessions post depression. There's, as they like to say in the Wall Street, there's dry, dry tinder, if you will, dry kindling right out on the sidelines, waiting for the right projects, isn't there? There, there is. But, but let me qualify that by saying that if you are, we get a lot of companies that, that, first of all, you made a comment early on about how we're just sort of reshuffling the deck. That's absolutely correct. I was talking to Michael Integli earlier in the week. Michael runs a development company. Every time we have a lead for an office client. It's typically a client that's leaving another building in the state. So we're all competing for the same clients. That's why the rent rates are down. Construction costs are going up. There's a huge funding gap on commercial real estate projects right now, and that's why private capital is not going to put money into those deals. So there is a real structural problem there. So from a developer investor standpoint, it's tough raising capital. If you're an end user, viable company it's not tough raising capital and what does that do to us on a global scale you know if we if we're in fighting amongst ourselves to to pull businesses from other communities into ours from other states into ours from other countries into ours uh you know that's a lot of time energy and and money spent on 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 that when you know i mean how does that affect us globally how does that affect our ability to compete globally if we can't stop competing with ourselves i you I'll probably get hate hate mail on this one, but I, I like to say frequently that Rhode Island's economically irrelevant. Um, we're just not a player in the game. We don't have the scale, the magnitude to play the game. So I don't believe we should be in the business of attempting to attract companies. I think we ought to focus on our product, make sure make sure our product is good, and the rest of it will happen for us. The reason why our market's so bad is because we have no population growth and no job growth. It's that simple. You know, there are some people out there that says we can attract population without jobs. In, in fact, Austin maybe did a little bit of that, but they had a UT there to help fuel it. But but in, I in think order it's to a do combination that, of both. In order to do that, Rhode Island has to be the ultimate bedroom community. You know, it has to be far cheaper than living in Boston than the, than the folks who work Which in Boston. Which it is now. It is, it, it is now. Um, but I don't think that it's going to offer the same amenities to folks. Uh, I mean, save for living in or around Providence, uh, you, you're not going to have the same, you know, entertainment infrastructure. You're not going to have the same opportunities for your kids, for your, you know, there are a lot of things that, that you don't get in Rhode Island I think as a bedroom community. 
I think Rhode Island needs to, my personal opinion is, I think we need to work much harder in drawing hard connections with Boston. You know, in, in, in the Northwest, there's this thing called the Cascade Regions, which mm-hmm. is really Portland, Seattle, and Vancouver. And they're really trying to create a trading block.